I'm here from Orbica, which is a company in Christchurch, and we do spatial data, but we also do a couple of passion projects. Um, and this is one of my passion projects. Now, we're going to start this with the most stupid question of the day. Who does remote sensing in GIS? Put your hands up. Oh, actually, that's good. So let's reverse it. Who doesn't do remote sensing in GIS? That's perfect. Um, this tool, which is a design for people to use to look at Sentinel-2 satellite data, came around from a couple of things. Uh, one is we've had clients talk to us and say we want tools for not GIS operators, but environmental monitoring consents operators to look at changes in landscape before and after, so someone with no um, skills in that field. And my dad. My dad is obsessed with that um, where on earth show that's on discovery where they show a couple of satellite images and randomly talk about completely different interpretations of them um, so we kind of he loves this stuff he loves looking at this stuff so we kind of started thinking about how we could start building an application that sort of addressed that um, and, and when i was teaching one of the sort of the major things we always show to people uh, is the ural sea on the border between uzbekistan and kazakhstan and now over the 20 or 30 years since water had been diverted, how the landscape had completely changed from a rich ecosystem, it supported fishing fleets, um, to a highly eutrophic wasteland, pretty much. Um, which, so it's pretty much been recognised as one of the, the largest man-made ecological kind of disasters on the planet. And this is a fantastic way to view it, and this is looking at something in a spatial context but also looking at it in a temporal context what's happening with changes over time and this is a question you know as geographers geologists physical geographers we all want to know this temporal aspect how does landscape change or how does human habitation change over time and and how can we view it really easily and satellite imagery is sort of one of the key things for this um, it's not really a fun process if you're doing it in the back end you have a satellite that beams data down to a ground station. This has some sort of spatial resolution on the ground. It has some sort of time-based resolution and some sort of spectral resolution, the, the, the wavelengths of data it's connecting in different slices. When you get that data and there's petabytes and petabytes of this data floating around, you can start thinking about how you process it. If you really want to do some really nice spectral analyses, these have to be corrected. You have to act, correct them for the water absorption in the atmosphere and also correct them on the ground for the geometry of them and, and basically make sure these are all georeferenced. Then if you're going beyond small chunks of data, we want to remove clouds. We want to make sure that the data we're looking at is actually cloud free. Uh, and in New Zealand that is, uh, I can't even go into how painful it is. Uh, cloud free New Zealand does not exist, land of the long white cloud constantly. Um, and mosaicing data from individual tiles into larger areas and how we serve these. Um, so if we're thinking of this concept of people being able to access data without doing any of this stuff, we pretty much just want to go from some sort of satellite imagery to the desktop for a user. Um, and the easiest way to do that is pay for it. Um, but it gets really, really expensive really, really fast. You know, if we look at our Worldview 3, this is kind of the gold standard of, of imagery. Uh, 1.2 metre uh, multispectral uh, and 30 centimetre panchromatic, and we use the panchromatic band to sharpen. Um, you're looking, if you want it, tasks is about 30 US dollars a square metre. Um, and if you want that without cloud, that's basically another 15 US dollars on top of that for under 5% cloud and you're going to buy a minimum of 100 square kilometers. So these prices ramp up really fast, you can't buy them in small chunks so if you're looking at small farms wanting to look at crop changes, uh, governmental organizations wanting to look at how you can look at small chunks of land that may have changed land use type, especially for consenting, um, it really puts it out of the game park for a lot of people uh, and when we talk to clients like city councils they say we want high resolution as possible in near real time to the desktop for free um, <laughs> and it's ridiculous how many times I've heard this and of course that's completely impossible uh, you know especially at, when you add free into it it really throws a spanner in the works so we kind of came up with this idea for this application that someone who was working at a desktop, a consents officer, could look at something quickly to make quick sort of observational changes. 
no really flash tools in it, just something really simple they can look at a before and after an event. So the data requirements for this is obviously, number one, we're all Kiwis, we love free data, and the Australians, I presume, presume love free data. Everyone loves free data. Um, so highest resolution possible, based on the caveat of number one, short revisit times, based on the caveat of number one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, application, got to be free, everyone loves free. And I call it the dad level of being able to use it. If I can put it in front of my father and he can run it, that is the perfect target of operations. Anything more complicated than two or three buttons, it breaks. So to do that, we also needed to have all of our data processing, pan sharpening, band creation, indices creation, has to be on the server side. Um, and we wanted things that worked relatively fast so people could just jump on the desktop and it's kind of that seamless experience like a Google Maps. Um, as I'll show you today, that didn't happen because the service is now playing up and everything's loading really, really slow. Uh, whenever you do a tech demo, this seems to happen. It seems to be some law. Um, so I'll we'll show you some of the data, but it's a bit of pre-cache stuff. This application is for anyone to use. You can jump on the website, have a look at it, have a play with it, because we're interested in feedback of how people use it and how people interact with it. Uh, this is a very alpha version, so it's um, something that we're still developing. So when we think about data and we think about free data, Landsat and the Copernicus program are sort of the, the gold standards of what we can get for free. Landsat's roughly around 30 metres a pixel. Uh, it's been collecting Landsat 5 since about 1980-something, 84, 85. Um, and Copernicus, the, especially the Sentinel-2, which we use for our sort of RGB imagery, has been running since 2016. So we've got some quite good free data sets out there at various scales that people can look, for, look at for free. And it's again, it's that process of how does someone who doesn't know about remote sensing or know about GIS access this data? It's free, people can jump online, they can just start grabbing it themselves, they can do all the processing themselves. But if you don't have that background knowledge, it becomes far, far harder. So we're really concentrating on Sentinel-2. Sentinel-2 is very spectrally rich. You can do a lot with it. It's 12 bands of data that come through at various resolutions from 10 meters up to 60 meter resolution, but it's for free data, it's incredibly rich. So we started building um, a website and I started building a website and it was awful. Uh, Benika at the back and Santosh, they took my disastrous code and refactored it into something useful. Um, and so we basically used all these open source technologies, but pretty much the main guts of it are hanging off Leaflet as the mapping side of it. And we use a service called Sentinel Hub. Um, Sentinel Hub is a service run out of Czechoslovakia, uh, not Czechoslovakia, it's Slovenia. Slovenia. There we go. It was either one of the two, it was either Slovakia or Slovenia. Great guys, and they released this product where you can basically use their really cool backend with APIs to do stuff. We thought about doing our own data cube, but for lazy old me, this was a really cool way of getting stuff prototyped really quickly. Uh, and so Sentinel Hub kind of works in this way where they have a whole bunch of data up there. So they've got Landsat for all of Europe, unfortunately not New Zealand, but Sentinel data comes down all the time from late 2015. Everything comes down to the AWS server, which you can access. The cool thing is that they have at their server end this sort of ability to write your own scripts. So for us wanting to build a, a pathway to a, a REST endpoint, we can start saying, let's code up some backend stuff, we can do some indices, we can do pan sharpening, and that's basically directly handed out as a service um, to a website. Uh, and especially when we can do indices, we can just code as many indices as we want. So in the back end, I think we have 50 something indices or something ridiculous like that, because you can just keep on programming them and they just appear as services. The other cool thing with Sentinel Hub is it also has a full Python API. So we can do machine learning, we can do build our own data cubes from it, um, which gives us a lot of power to do stuff in-house and on the desktop as well. And the reality is that's a really cheap service for what you get, a commercial account with a, a low amount of hits is like 100 euro a month. It makes it quite fun for us to develop stuff in-house and play with stuff and see how we can sort of develop these products. So the product we came up with is something called Explorer. Um, it is designed around time. It's designed around virtually no controls, dad level controls, date, 
and some pull downs. So what I'll show you now is hopefully, I'll show you, this is the bit where I hold my breath. So this is how the app looks. Uh, it's really simple, you log in, and it allows you to basically go through and choose various functions. Uh, now I'm drunk driving over here. Basically it allows you to choose different sort of le levels of complexity. So make that a bit. And we've got a, a few number of different indices up here and two dates and two times. So not only can you compare the same time with different data, you can compare different times with the same data. Uh, and so this is really good for sort of various little sort of tools that we use. This here is an area of Christchurch. Uh, this is large amounts of irrigation that's gone on. And to, to look at the difference between, uh, where's my eyes when I need them? 2019 and 2018, we can just slide between them. And so it's designed so you can easily look at landscape change um, at this level. We're adding a bunch of other tools into this. One is a statistics feature service where a user can come along, draw a little polygon around it and say what's happened in this time and it will plot up a difference. So this is a normalized difference water index, no moisture index for this one. Um, so it's very sort of very simple for people to get access to these really simply. So here's another example, Coffs Harbour, we're looking at the fires at the moment. Uh, so this imagery is from five days ago. Sentinel captures imagery every five days, so it automatically updates to the latest imagery. Uh, and we're looking at one of the shortwave infrared bands, and you can see where the active burn fronts are. Really clearly. So again, really simple. I can send this to my dad and go, hey, look at this, this is kind of interesting. Um, and you get things like that. So we have a bunch of different things. We have uh, vegetation indexes on there, a number of them. We have the SWIR. We've got, I think they are the main two examples I had up. So we have a bunch of different things that allow people to really simply go in there and, and look at data like those indexes, which they wouldn't have been able to do before. So yeah, so as I said, this is an alpha stage. Um, we've still got lots of work to do on the API and even the UX. It's, uh, it's basically a passion project we're working on on the side. Statistics service is really key for us. Sentinel Hub completely supports it. Basically, you click on a point and it just generates the time series of that point with a really nice API. Change notification is really important to us where we can start going, how has an area changed over time? Can we get a notification from it? Again, if we think about the council level where they're looking at a tiny area and saying, has this been deforested? Draw an area around it and look at the changes over time. Um, that also ties, ties into more data sources. Um, our key at the moment is building an open data cube with Landsat 5 that goes back to 1985. So lots of interest around the emissions trading scheme forestry pre-1990, post-1990. So this is, gives us an awesome tool to be able to say to people, how does this change over time? What areas are you interested in? So yeah, that Landsat data cube is, is sort of one of the big things and we're gonna use the open data cube that Alex and Caitlin have been working on. So yeah, and the other thing is doing animated GIF exports, everyone loves them. Um, just being able to quickly choose an area and saying, produce an animated GIF that covers, you know, very short time periods or very long time periods, cloud, relatively cloud free. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, again, it's a, it's a tool we want people to go out and use and sort of experience and dare I say it, break it uh, and try to figure out how we can do better things with it. Um, we have a thing downstairs, we've got a little stall downstairs with a couple of computers that are running so people can jump on it now. Um, otherwise, go to explorer.orbica.world you sign up. No, we're not going to spam you with anything, but it's just a, a way for us to collect users and collect some feedback from you at the end. Cool. Uh, that's pretty much me. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, we have plenty of time for questions. Oh, how so, short am I? Um, hey? How short am I? Uh, you are 14 minutes. Oh. <laughs> so we have any questions from the audience? 
All right, well, I will <laughs> happily kick things off. So I really love that you tested this. You know, you were saying it had to be dad friendly. <laughs> How often did you test it with your dad? Quite a bit. Like I can't, how I much is quite a bit? <laughs> uh, I do something, I do a change and say, D can, you, can you operate this? And he'd be like, what does this do? How, I, I don't understand. So there was kind of different iterations and I'd put up things like NDVI. What does that mean? Well, it looks at plant health by looking at near infrared absorption, blah, blah, blah. And it, what? I don't, ah, ah. <laughs> So, so that, and that's why you go, you know, it doesn't come up as NDVI, it says plant health. You know, and then there's a little drop down that says this is an NDVI. So it was that, you know, it, it is an end user focused product where we've kind of thought about the kind of target audience who will use it and then worked our way back instead of going, we're a bunch of GIS remote sensing nerds, we can do all these cool tools that are just going to completely just destroy people if they don't have that not background knowledge behind it. Um, so it's something, you know, in the focus on the end user is something we're really key on at Orbica and that's kind of our development almost runs backwards because of that. Oh, there's a question down the back. Can you add third party data sources to that yeah, display Yes, live? you can. Yeah, again, it's um, we're just pulling in the Sentinel hub data as a, a rest endpoint, uh, WMS, it's a tiled WMS basically. Um, so we are looking at when we move to the, the cent uh, when we move to the uh, Landsat 5 stuff, that's got to be separate because Sentinel Hub give Landsat 7, Landsat 5, Landsat 8, but they've only cached it for the Northern Hemisphere and so we can't use it. So we're starting to look at how we can add other data sources in there. Because it's driven on leaflet, we can. We, it's easy enough to sort of start using the leaflet side of it just to pull in feature services, etc, etc. So we're only using the Sentinel Hub as one part. And our sort of long-term plan is we'll move away from that and start doing our own data cube. If, a, if and when a New Zealand-wide data cube arrives, I know there's lots of discussion about that at the moment, you know, being able to tap into that, pull information on. Again, it's, it's about what the end user wants. Um, we can start just loading that data up, you know. We, we all know there's a million different free data sources around the place. You know, you can throw it all up there and my dad would be, ah. You know, so it's about, it's about avoiding that situation and really sort of, you know, as I say, this is, this is for GIS, not for GIS people. You almost need to trim that GIS part of your brain out and think about, you know, I'm interested in landform change. I'm interested in how cities change. What do I need to see that at a simple level? And this is why it is so simple and why we haven't gone overboard on all these different tools. Um, developing this product from receiving the data from the satellites and then having that web um, HTML server, what were your main choke points? Like what really took your time in developing? So you had this idea and then what really took time? In I haven't this? coded in like 20 years was probably the biggest stumbling point. So I was kind of learning CSS, I was learning JavaScript kind of on the fly looking for examples and kind of mashing things together and that's why when Benika jumped on board and took over my code I think I think we basically started from scratch again um, again it's it's, all, it's a bunch of simple tools and you know you, you go to GIS teams and you say well we've got this thing that slides between two different data, data layers and they're like that's not interesting at all you know we can do that been able to do that for years in ArcGIS but putting it in the context of satellite data and putting it in the context of change for end users who don't have experience to that was kind of the big thing you know it's how the probably one of the hardest thing for us in the development is what we didn't put in we had all these cool ideas and it's like well we can't really put that into something that someone's not ever going to use we just have to keep on stripping it back until it's you know the bare bones of what it is all right we've got one time for one more question at the back so it's good that this is the last question because I have to ask, your favourite imagery you've played with? Oh, we've, um, you know, I did lots of work in Antarctica and we used Worldview 3 down there and, and it is spectacular, but we did some really cool stuff looking at, we were playing around with visualisations and we were looking at the irrigated lands through Canterbury and actually doing weird time series where 
each of the RGB bands, each of the colours was represented by a different time and a different date. Uh, and it was like these pure pastel driven LSD crazy, you know, I, I really want to take some up and blow them big up on my walls because they looked amazing. And it was just because we're taking that temporal data and using it in a really different way, it just produced these amazing results. That was, yeah, it was really, really interesting.